Okay, we'll go ahead and get started on the theory portion of learning React.js. So we're just gonna do hello world, as well as some of the uh, basic theory on, on React. Um, you know, anytime you learn a technology, at least the way my brain works, is I wanna understand the popularity of a technology. Um, and, you know, basically, what is this technology going to do for me? Uh, in the in the job market, right? So so that's the approach I look at. Um, and so this is something I always lean on. You guys have seen me lean on this. Uh, developer survey is released every year. So in May of this year, ninety thousand developers um, responded about you know surveys and all sorts of things uh, about surveys about technology, what they're using, what tools they're using, what languages they're using, AI, what's their, who they are, what's their education. You know, this is a good tool to have in your back pocket. Um, so when I go to most popular technologies, um, JavaScript is still at the top, JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. Um, Python is really in the last, you know, seven years or so really kind of jumped the charts. Um, Python is popular, number one, because it's easy to learn. So a lot of high schools teach it because it's taught at the high school level. It's kind of flows up. It's also used a lot in, with big data and like taking um, lots of data stored in a database and making pretty charts out of it. Um, so, so Python has a really good use case because that's what decision makers need is they need, you know, to analyze all their data. Uh, SQL, TypeScript, okay, so these are the, the popular languages. There's C Sharp still, Java, C Sharp are up there. Um, moving down though, when you kind of go into past the databases, past cloud, here, when we look at web frameworks, um, which is what we're learning here, we're learning a full stack framework of course, Node and React are the top frameworks that are out there. Now, um, of course, you now know Node is used to build backends, right? To, to help us build express servers and, um, you know, to build a backend built on JavaScript. We need, we need the runtime environment that is Node. And here you see React, 40% of respondents use React as compared to what we used to teach in this curriculum was jQuery, right? So jQuery used to be JavaScript for the front end. Now almost double the amount of developers use React over something like jQuery. Um, of course, Express, it's interesting the node can be so high and Express not, but, but nonetheless, React's closest competitor is Angular. So I remember years ago when these JavaScript libraries were kind of newer and it was a little bit more competitive as far as should you learn React or should you learn Angular? You know, by these numbers, it's pretty clear that React is the leader in the space. The next closest competitor uh, that, that's a front end framework built on JavaScript, okay? So React is a big one, Angular is a big one, and Vue is another one. Right, these are front end frameworks built on JavaScript. Those are kind of the three competitors. And again, React kind of holds, uh, uh, is the current is the current leader. Of course, that could always change in the future, but it seems to me that React is the horse you wanna bet on. Um, and so what is React? And of course, any tutorial when you're learning React, I've watched a dozen of them. They always start on react.dev. They always start on the homepage. And, and they all say the same thing, right? Just basically, most concisely, React is a JavaScript library uh, for building user interfaces. Um, at React's core, you have these things called components. Um, so in React, you use this language called JSX to build components. And these components, if you think back to HTML, you had a, a document tree, okay? And I, 
you know, can, can kind of uh, HTML document tree. You guys might remember the HTML document tree uh, images. Something very simple like this, right? Um, where you, you have this root element, you have one root element, and then you have children elements, right? Remember this from HTML? Um, components work the same way. Components are basically HTML and JavaScript together. Okay, this JSX language is just that. It's JavaScript and HTML kind of merged together. Okay, and you build components. And these components have a document tree or a component tree, just like HTML does. And so when you're learning React, you're learning to build components, which are just little pieces of the user interface. And you can put components inside one another, very similar to HTML. And you can have nested elements in HTML. You can have nested components in React. Okay. Um, Again, a lot of tutorials when you're like, hey, uh, I want to learn React and, and what is a component, uh, they can take you to a grant, uh, page like Instagram. And you can see um, if, you, if you start to break down the, the pieces of a interface, okay, you can begin to see components, okay, and so you have to kind of visualize the different areas of, of a page. And if I were to kind of grab a snipping tool, um, we would have something like a nav bar. Okay, and so if I just look at this nav bar component, um, this, this would be one, one section of Instagram. And then within the nav bar component, you would have what are called component items. And so each one of these, if I can draw on this, becomes a component item, uh, excuse me, a nav bar item. So, so one component would be the nav bar. And then inside of the nav bar component, you would have nav bar items. Okay, and each nav bar item has two inputs. Right? What are the two inputs? Well, the input would the first input would be the icon, and the second input would be the piece of text. Okay? Icon, piece of text, icon, piece of text. So you see kind of the repetitiveness of a component. Um, so again, you've got kind of one big component, one parent component that would be the nav bar. And then you've got child components, which are nav bar items. Okay, so when you're in, when you're starting to think of React, you're going to start to break down the user interface into components, and then, uh, you know, parent components and child components. Again, kind of making that tree. Well, one, even kind of backing up. Let me get open my little. One thing about components is you always need a root. Okay, so kind of starting at the root, right, you would just have the app. Okay, so the app component would sort of be the root. And if I had to break down the app component into children, the first child would be navbar. Okay, now the sibling of navbar. The sibling of, I don't know, what would we call this? These are the uh, feeds? Story. No, that's not, not a feed, that's a story. story, thank you. So maybe we would have a story component. And each story component is broken into two things. We have the story item, which is the uh, profile uh, picture, right? And the text, the, 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 the account name, right? So again, we have, comp we have the parent component, which is app, and I'll draw this on the board, right? So we have an app component, and the first child of app would be navbar, and then a child of navbar would be nav item. 
Okay, so these are the components on Instagram. And then what was the next one we just said? Those were shorts? Stories. Stories, thank you. So I would have another sibling of Mavbar for stories, and then a story item. You guys starting to see how this, you know, you start with the interface that you want, and from there you start to make your components. Well, what other components do we see? Well, you know, we're going to have a feed, right? A feed, again, you're going to see repetitive, you're going to see repetitive things inside the feed, right? But we have a feed, and maybe, I guess, based, just based on what we're saying here, is a feed item, or, or a post, you might call it, right? An individual post. Now a post, you could even break down a post into different sections, right? Which is maybe if I look at a if I look at a post and we were to break it down, we could break it into post content and then maybe post footer. What goes on the footer? You would have a like icon, save for later. These are different items inside of a post. So you could break down a post even further for for this and we would have a uh, post content uh, and then maybe in, as a sibling to post content we have post footer and then what's left uh, what's left is this right hand nav uh, section, this right section, which is what? What is, how would we categorize this? This is, uh, you know, suggested friends, profile, profile up top, along with suggested friends. So maybe we would just call this the, the profile. And then maybe next to profile, underneath profile, we've got, um, now, now it's really interesting, you know, how would you call this uh, section down here where you're, they're suggesting friends? A lot of times, you know, if you're thinking about the intent of Instagram, they're just getting you trying to spend more time. The more you scroll, right, that's obviously, <coughs> You know, you're spending time when you're scrolling. But of course, they want you to follow more people because the more people you follow, the more time you ultimately spend scrolling, right? So there's, there's definitely a bit of intent here when they're suggesting friends for you to follow, um, basically, ultimately, uh, trying to get you to spend more time. Um, you know, so, so the, uh, you know, maybe you just call that the intent section. Uh, something along those lines uh, when you're trying to get people to to follow. Okay, now, so back up a little bit. We've kind of broken down Instagram into components. What's the benefit of components? Why, why are these components a good thing? Um, and as these apps, let me, I guess I could back up. React was created uh, 12 years ago by Facebook, okay? And if you think of Facebook's interface, it's quite a bit more complex than the one we just looked at, uh, Instagram. There's a lot of pieces going on with Facebook. And anytime you code, you guys have seen this, the bigger your application, you make one change over here and it winds up screwing up some code you know, kind of often on, on the side, right? And it's your code often, one piece of code interacts and changes something unintended consequence of another piece of code. Okay, so when you have this nature in coding, when making changes in one area changes other areas as well, you want to make everything as independent as possible. And by changing one component, 
you shouldn't really be screwing with or you know messing with another component okay so one major benefit of these components is they're completely independent of one another okay so this was react was created by uh, some developer in Facebook and maybe someone um, react developer name I forget the guy's name at Facebook I came across his name recently but but it wasn't just one guy a lot of times they want to give credit to one guy it's it's a team most of the times uh, but it was a team of developers at Facebook and and why why at Facebook? Why did it make sense for Facebook? Well, Facebook has a complex UI. Making change to one part of the code would screw with other parts of the code, and they wanted to make these different pieces of code independent of one another. Okay, it's very object-oriented in nature the way I think about it because you have independent objects. You have these independent components, right, that, that don't have to, you know, um, when you change one object it kind of doesn't change the other okay um, another thing about components is that they're meant to be generally smaller that makes them easier to troubleshoot okay so benefits of components again changing one component shouldn't change another uh, they're generally smaller chunks of code easier to troubleshoot it really works well in the team nature you know for example in this class, if we wanted to rebuild Instagram, I could put four of you on the nav bar component. I could put four of you on stories, four of you on feed, four of you on profile. You all can work on your independent teams individually, you know, separate from one another, and then be able to merge them together. And again, they should work independent, right? So you can work on teams, you know, um, and because of the nature of these components, um, it's, it's good for that. Um, it is open source. React is open source. So what, what's the advantage of open source software? Well, it's open to the community. So the community can find bugs. They can fix bugs. They can fix performance issues. Um, open source software is really powerful um, because it's not a small team of people working on it. It can be anybody and everybody. Um, it has pretty well effectively replaced jQuery. What jQuery was, was a way of like animating things onto the screen and off of the screen. And jQuery was really about animations and getting like uh, really flashy, if you will, animations on your HTML page. Um, today's websites, it's always cool when you see a flashy site. Flashy sites are cool but good sites are performant, right? More important than cool, flashy, way more than cool than flashy is performant, right? You want fast websites. I mean, amazon.com isn't really the flashiest website, right? It's just a bunch of products and it's fast and it works and you one click buy, okay? So jQuery was this JavaScript library for animations and flashiness and kind of like ooh like you know transitions on the page um, but that's not really our primary objective nowadays nowadays we just want fast um, okay a while ago and I'm actually kind of happy that we we kind of saw this coming um, React hooks were released in 2018 in whatever version of React and React hooks were a big way, so instead of using reusable classes in JavaScript, you know, there are JavaScript classes, um, now our components, components used to be built with JavaScript classes, but now um, components are built using JavaScript functions. So as we actually install React and we look at our first component, um, we're going to see that it's actually a function and not a class. And so that was a paradigm shift around 2018 that more or less said in the future, all of our components will be built using these functions. And so we have, we at Rankin have been using hooks um, for, for several years now. 
Um, and again, React is gaining traction, including gaining ground against Angular and, and Vue. Okay, so React is popular. React is a JavaScript front-end library for building components. Components are uh, these things built in this language called JSX. JSX is JavaScript and HTML kind of merged together. You build these component trees. Component trees have one root, one root element, and then you break down the interface pieces into these different components and subcomponents. Okay, one thing that really screwed with me as I was learning React is I could not get over these definitions of imperative programming versus declarative programming. Okay, so I guess the first thing to learn about React is that you use these things called components. And then another thing to learn is that it's a different style of programming. It's, it's a declarative way of working um, with with the HTML versus an imperative way. Now, this screwed with me at first and I really had a hard time with it until I learned that there are other languages that I've learned that are declarative. I just didn't learn that they were declarative. Okay? So let me let me give you another language that is declarative and this helped me. Okay? SQL, structured query language is declarative. So React is declarative and SQL is declarative. And the way that it works in my brain, the difference between declarative and imper imperative. Declarative is more of a black box in the sense you just declare what you want. You just say, like in SQL, select star from a table. I don't know what's in that table, just give me everything in the table. And, and more important than that, I don't know, I don't know kind of behind the scenes what's happening to actually get all of that data and send it back to me. Okay, declarative is more high level. It's just like, I know what I want, select star, give me everything. And then I'm just gonna let the language figure it out how to give it to me. Okay, so the very like low level, low at a low level, how the data is retrieved and how the data is returned and how the data is given to you, that's all kind of in a black box. I don't really understand it. So in React, you just kind of say, hey, you know, I want this variable in my HTML, and I don't really know what the value of that variable, what that data is gonna look like. It's, you're just kind of declaring what you want, and then like the specific implementation, that's gonna happen later. Like how that data gets put in there and what that looks like. Declarative is just like, here's what I want, figure it out later. Okay, imperative, if, when I think of an imperative language, oh, by the way, HTML is also declarative. When I think of an imperative language, I think of JavaScript. JavaScript is very detailed down to the, you know, I'm going to go into the document. I'm going to get an element by ID. I'm going to tell its inner HTML to be equal to this string. Okay, so imperative programming languages are like JavaScript and they're like C sharp, where you have to very detail oriented tell tell the uh, tell tell the computer what to do. Okay, so it's much less black box. You have to like be very specific on on how to code it. So again, React is declarative. It's just a little different in in how we actually code uh, in React. Okay, it's more black box, if you will. There's a lot going on behind the scenes that we just have to figure out how to work it. And we don't have to, we don't have to in detail, go into the document, get the element by the ID, add a class to it called red, you know? Um, would you say that's more efficient? To do it? It's easier to learn. I would say it's easier to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so certain languages are declarative and, and don't let, again, it tripped me up. Don't let it trip you up. It's just like HTML is declarative, SQL is declarative. Other languages we learn have been considered imperative. Um, again, we already talked about uh, kind of the team nature of, of React and how it works well in teams. And 
Uh, you can implement a feature on your team and your team, your team take different features. This leads to fewer bugs um, uh, as features overlap with each other and need to work together. Okay. So basically imperative is teaching the person, like teaching a person how to do something that doesn't know how to do it and then declarative would be telling somebody that already knows how to do it to do it. What I just got from that okay, yeah, if that, if that works for you, that, that makes sense. Um, okay, another, okay, so idea number one, idea number one in React is that there are components. Idea number two is it's imperative, a little bit more black box, right? So we have components and we have a different style of programming. Number three is this concept of a shadow DOM. Now, in vanilla JavaScript, we learned about the document object model, and we learned how in the browser, there's this hierarchy of elements, and if you want to change an element, you know, how to traverse the DOM, select an element, you know, and add uh, a CSS class to it. So we learned, we learned manipulating the DOM in the JavaScript class. Um, we don't work with the JavaScript DOM, in with react react has its own what's called shadow dom okay and the shadow dom is a copy of the javascript dom so start start with this concept right react has this thing called shadow dom and it's a copy pretty simple concept it's a copy of the regular dom and then when you make changes in react it does what's called a diff, very similar to like when you push your GitHub changes. It sees what's different on your local machine compared to your GitHub repository. It sees what changes and it updates the DOM for you. Okay, why is that beneficial? Well, it turns out when in vanilla JavaScript, you get all these different programmers scripting the DOM in all these various ways, a lot of inefficiencies are created. Okay, so when you, you introduce this concept called Shadow DOM, it leads to better performance because scripting the actual DOM itself is handled for you by the Shadow DOM. So the Shadow DOM is just kind of something that happens in the background. You don't really have to give it any special commands, right? As we code in React, there's this shadow DOM. It's a copy of the JavaScript DOM. When you make changes in React, it sees what changes you make. It figures out what changes need to be applied to the page, and it only changes what it needs to. Okay, And that just leads to, in general, performance <coughs> improvements. So we have components in React. We have declarative programming, kind of a different style. And we have this shadow DOM for performance. We talked about React using this JSX, which is a mix of JavaScript and HTML. So you're gonna kind of merge these two together to make this JSX. Um, our browsers like Chrome and Firefox and Edge, they don't know what JSX code is. So JSX is rendered on the server and HTML is sent down to the client. Okay, now as we're learning React and we talk about its benefits, that's actually a shortfall of React. A shortfall of React is that um, it, is, it is what is, is called transpiled, right? So it's processed on the server and then HTML and CSS is sent down to the client. Um, that does not, what, what it boils down to is it React by itself because it, it kind of runs on the server. Uh, uh, the, the JSX is run on the server and then the HTML is sent down to the client. Um, it's not the best for search engines. Turns out that search engines like Google, they crawl your uh, they crawl your sites, uh, and when you have just like raw HTML, uh, it understands very well 
what's going on uh, in the HTML. But the way that, that this is uh, server-side transpiled, and it's not really raw HTML until it's sent out the door down to the client, turns out that Google has a hard time really understanding the content that's on these pages. And so there, when, as you learn React, okay, as we learn React, we're gonna learn React. You're gonna learn after React, there's a whole world of things based on React. Okay, there's like Next.js and all these other libraries that kind of learning React is the first step in the way, but then there's all these other libraries. And there are libraries out there that help your React code run client side more so, so it's better for search engines. Uh, I forget which one that is, I gotta think. Uh, maybe I'll come back to that. Okay, so that's actually, this, this part right here um, can be, be viewed as a negative um, as, as React works out of the box. Um, React uses these uh, ES modules. We've been using ES modules, the imports and the exports all semester, versus um, out of the box, Node uses CommonJS, right? So we're, we're already more familiar with these imports and exports because we've been doing them all semester. And there we go, okay? So that's, that's the, the quick version, right? That's the quick version of React. React is a JavaScript framework for building front-end interfaces. You build these components, these components are in a tree. It's a little bit different because it's declarative. It has this thing called the Shadow DOM. It has this language called JSX. JSX is not understood by the browser, so it actually gets basically deep, uh, transpiled is a funny word, but um, it gets <laughs> processed on the server into HTML and CSS and sent down to the client, which can be viewed as not a good thing. And there we go. Um, so now we're gonna do hello world, okay? I guess another thing to discuss as we get into hello world um, is that there are many approaches to starting a React application. Um, in your first semester, you guys did a final project that was based on React. The point of that final project really was to give you guys some exposure, okay? Some exposure to React and talking to you guys in here is like, ah, I understood maybe, you know, some parts, but other parts were more confusing, you know? Well, React has a little good learning curve and we just wanted to expose you to it once and so now you're seeing it a second time. In that first semester, we used a um, we knew, we used a node module called Create React App, and um, if you look at Create React App, it hasn't been updated in two years. I believe it's kind of marked for. Uh, expiration okay so this was one way that you could kind of use a template to get started using react however um, it doesn't really it's it's basically becoming old okay so there are newer faster more efficient ways um, of which we're going to use again there's different there's different ways to um, to start a React application. My observation, at least several tutorials that that I look at, um, use this tool called Vite. Again, this is just the starting point. There's a lot of ways you could start a React application, and you can see its last published was three days ago. Um, and so we're going to get our template, if you will, for our React application using Vite. And the command to do so is npm create Vite at latest. Okay, so we're just gonna start empty folder and we're going to hello world this using the template, if you will, built on top of Vite instead of create React app for those reasons listed. Now, I would even say over the summer, I had students, uh, including Tony, uh, right, use Create React App. And uh, there were, 
create react app has dependencies and some of those dependencies are no longer updated right so there are some pretty well known bugs that are no longer getting updated if you use create react app and there were some head scratchers tony called me over once over the summer uh, to, to kind of troubleshoot a problem and it was like hey this is a known problem and good luck you know and so it was a little bit of a head scratcher that's another reason why we I don't personally want to use this create racked app anymore okay so let's do hello world and let's take we're just gonna take a look at this let's create a new folder hello world react open with code Go to the terminal. And the command, it's on the document, is npm create vite at latest. npm create vite at latest. Now, I think it assumes the current directory. So I think you just hit enter there. Now, project name v project. So it will create a subfolder. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna can this. Okay, and I'm gonna open up a new terminal. I'm gonna run that command again. npm uh, well npm create v at latest. I'm gonna hit dot. And that now, if I say HW React is the package name, hello world React, I believe it'll assume this folder as the root folder. Um, okay, and then we get to say, okay, what framework do we want to bring in? You can see that this Vite can be used for vanilla JavaScript, for Vue, for React, all these different frameworks. Of course, we are choosing React, so use the arrow keys to arrow down to React. And um, we will dabble in some TypeScript this semester, okay? But for now, we're just choosing JavaScript. I forget what the SWST stands for. I looked it up the other day, can't remember. But safe to say, we're just using JavaScript. Okay, and there we go. And um, it put it in the sub, the current directly instead, uh, current directory instead of a subfolder, and it says done look how quick that was by the way how much faster was that if you remember than create react app okay so just in general you're going to see performance benefits using this v and it tells you what to do it says run npm install okay that's going to install the dependencies and then it says npm space run space dev um which i guess there are a lot of dependencies here so that'll take a second now our script package json here's our here's our script called dev it tells you to npm run dev so npm run dev okay it says it is now running on localhost port 5173 and if you control click uh, we get the template, which is V plus React. Okay, there's a little uh, counter, which this count is a hook. Yeah, James, what's up? Okay, now, why might you get errors? I will look at it. One thing, I don't have any spaces in my folder name. Um, so that's typically something that's pretty common. What else? Yep. Oh, default browser. Um, so that's going to be in your Visual Studio settings. You're going to have to change kind of your default browser uh, in Visual Studio settings. Ah, uh, where exactly is that? So let me help James, and then I'll help you out. But that's that's basically what you're looking for. Okay. So now that this is up and running, let's look around a little bit and close the things that I don't need. Uh, 
Okay, now I've closed everything again. So let me just control click, open this in the browser. This is what we get. We get this little thing called count. It says edit the source app JSX to save to test. Okay, so it tells us a little bit more about where our source code is. Source directory app JSX. So source directory app JSX. You might remember um, the hook called use state. And the word the word state just means uh, you should never use a word to define itself, but the the state of a component, meaning the condition that it's in, which really boils down to the data, the data inside of a component. That is that is the state of a component. And so we have this function called app, and we have a button that when we click the button, now first off, this is JSX, and notice how inside of our JSX we're kind of merging the HTML world with the JavaScript world, kind of two parts together. And then we're exporting default app. So up top, we have a JavaScript function called app. It begins on line six, it ends on line 33, and then we export it. Um, inside of the app, we have a return function, which returns some HTML mixed with JavaScript. This is our JSX. So the, the easiest thing we could do, right, is delete everything. By the way, this is called an empty fragment on line 10. One thing that we'll learn is that every element, uh, by every element, I mean every component, this is the app component, every component has to have one parent. Um, since this is just a bunch of siblings, notice the div is a sibling with the h1, sibling with this div. There was no parent component, so we add a, what's called an empty fragment to have a single parent. It's just kind of a, a trick, if you will. We could just delete all of this. Let's just return h1, hello world. Now in this case, there are no children here. There's just one parent, which is the H1. Uh, I can control click and there we go. It says, hello world. By the way, back in the, the 70s, the first time a computer said, hello world, uh, everyone thought that they had artificial intelligence. The, world the first time a computer said, hello world, we thought we had AI. The, the first time a computer beat a human in chess, the world thought we had AI. And now we have large language models that can kind of make good sentences and kind of speak to us. And again, we think we have AI. But anyways. <laughs> The Go video. Oh, that's a good documentary. Yeah, I watched that. I was like, no, this is good. Isn't that good? I watched it during like my break or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I got, I got actually for a second. I'm glad you liked it. I'm glad you liked it. That's a good documentary. Yeah. Mr. G. Yes. You want to know when creating components, the first letter in the name has to be capitalized, otherwise it will not work. Good observation. Let's make our own component. So we have this app component um, inside of assets. Let's go ahead and create a new file. Let's make a, sure, hello world.jsx. We're gonna make our own component. Again, the JSX uh, extension is something that we, we see in Vite. Actually, whoops, put it in the wrong place. It needs to be in source, not in assets. If you made it inside of assets, drag and drop it back into the source. Now, you can do something like an export default function, hello world. 
and I'm going to return So when I think of making a component, I think of almost like you're making a tag. And this tag is reusable. You can reuse these components. The only difference between, besides making a tag, is, well, it's a tag, but it's got JavaScript. So it's, it's HTML and JavaScript. You're making this reusable thing, very similar to an HTML tag. It's reusable. You can use it a bunch. So this hello world JSX, hello world from my hello world component. Now, instead of saying hello world here, we need to import uh, and again the the syntax I always I always got to look up the syntax here import uh, let's see. I'm going to throw the here. It's a uh, hello world from components hello world. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's just. Hold on one second. And then you can use this like a tag. Uh, no curly brackets. No you curlies. Ex you export default. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so let's do this. He'll import hello world from. This directory is dot slash. Now, this directory is, we don't have a components directory. And do I need to put the dot JSX here? I don't know. So import hello world from, because we're coding app JSX, there is no components directory. Uh, we might need to put the .jsx here. I, I don't know. We don't? No. Okay, so we're just going to say from hello world. And let's save that up. And let's boot. And then hello world from my hello world component. Well, now we have a component that's reusable. We could say hello world, hello world, hello world. What's our problem right here? We no longer have one parent. When all you have is one element, that element is the parent. These three siblings do not have a parent, so when you just want to fake it, you do a little fake it, what's called a React fragment. You nest all three children inside of this empty parent. And now you've got a reusable component. Please. How is mine centered? Well, if we take a look at app, let's look at app CSS. We see a whole lot of, well, maybe text align centered. Um, so did you delete the import up at the top? Yep. So we do have a little bit of styling here being applied from our app CSS. Right? Maybe we want to do a little CSS here. So let's, instead of source, let's create a new file. We'll call it hello world.css. Nah, you could put your own custom CSS in here. You could also put it inside of app. It would also work. But let's also, let's just put our H3s here and say color of red. So all of our H3s should go red. And we got a link to it, right? So just because we made the CSS does not mean that we have a link to it. So very similar to how we imported the app CSS here. Let's go up to the top of our JSX. Let's import, uh, again, syntax here. No, no name, just import the CSS file inside of quotes. Hello world.css. If you want to be more specific, you could say the current directory is hello world CSS. This changes our H3s to red. 
So all of our H3s should be red, and there we go. Okay, so that's hello world. I mean, literally, that's all we're going to do here is hello world. Write a little, write a little uh, component, tie in some CSS, bring that component in as a child component of its parent. Um, we have a lot more to learn, but you know, we will do that in our first lab.